Towards a Spiritualized Society, Oroville, an Experiment in Prefigurative Utopianism. Doctoral Thesis by Suryamai Ashvini Clarence Smith. Chapter 5 Oroville, Prefiguring a Utopian Anarchic Polity. Quote, no one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried. Winston Churchill Quote, Should Orville have any more new committees? The mother does not agree to any new committees for Orville. She says, more committees, more useless talk. Words of the mother. As highlighted in the literature on intentional communities in Utopia, in chapters 3 and 4 of this thesis, respectively, Utopian communities have historically been based on ideal blueprints that predetermined how society should be organized. Among the founding ideals for Oroville as a spiritualized society, however, is to prefigure a divine anarchy, a polity responsive to the evolution of consciousness that integral yoga anticipated and that could be reformulated accordingly. This chapter will consider the anarchic nature of Oroville as a polity from its early years to today, while chapter six will focus on prefigurative spiritual practices in Oroville's collective decision-making processes. The first part of this chapter will consider the mother's original ideas for Oroville's political organization. In Oroville, simply referred to as organization or as collective organization, as a divine anarchy, and her charismatic authority during the founding period of the community. It will also examine how Orville's relationship with the Indian government is enabling of its internal anarchic practice. A detailed ethnographic description and assessment of the latter will be the object of the remainder of the chapter, which aims to element and further the empirical activist body of research on prefigurative anarchist forms of political organizing in grassroots social movements. While this literature is focused on direct actions, strategic enactments of popular protest within social movements, in Oroville, anarchist forms of decision-making have been used to shape an entire intentional society, offering an unparalleled opportunity to assess this mode of political organization. Such an examination is directly relevant for the Oroville community, within which there is a pervasive sentiment that our internal governance is onerous and uninspired and needs to be restructured. This internal critique mirrors concerns recently raised in academic research on the sustainability, effectiveness and equitability of such forms of radical political practice. The chapter also responds to an open question in intentional community research on how anarchist communities are able to perpetuate themselves. The Ideal of a Divine Anarchy What political organization do you want for Oroville? Someone asked the mother in 1972, four years after the founding of the community. An amusing definition occurs to me, she replied, a divine anarchy. When she passed away in 1973, just five years after Oroville was founded, she left no blueprint for Oroville, no plan for how it should be governed, or in her words, organized. No designated individuals who should assume this responsibility. In keeping with its philosophical basis of integral yoga, the community was to develop organically, in accordance with the progressive spiritualization of its members, and the kind of society that would emerge from this could not be anticipated. Quote, Men must become conscious of their psychic being and organize themselves spontaneously without fixed rules and laws. 
that is the ideal. However, in the early years of Orville, when she was still alive, the mother acted as a de facto guru, or charismatic leader, even though she never lived in the community, insisting it should be self-organized. Early members frequently sought her guidance, as evidenced by this section's opening question. By internal accounts, her authority was uncontested. To this day, statements she made about how Orville should be managed and organized are deployed by current members to lend weight to their proposals and decisions, or their criticism of others, so that her charismatic authority is argued to have become routinized. While she envisioned, quote, an organization which is the expression of a higher consciousness working to manifest the truth of the future, close quote, she also anticipated that a makeshift temporary solution would have to be exercised while the polity matured spiritually towards embodying this. At one point, she suggested a, quote, hierarchical organization grouped around the most enlightened center, close quote similar to the concept of philosopher kings that Plato proposed in the Republic. However, the radical political culture that had emerged in the 1960s and 1970s forefronted the feminist and anarchist non-hierarchical collectivist practices of decision-making based on consensus. And like many other intentional communities of this era, this was the form and ethos that was adopted in Oroville. This ethos remains strong today, even as the community moves towards more hierarchical and representative models of governance, a shift that we will look at in detail in this chapter. This transition is part of a broader phenomenon of formalization, institutionalization, and bureaucratization in the Orville context, one in which we see the profuse elaboration of policy, structure, and process. Weber predicts this for any form of organization or association as it scales and persists in time. While it is underway in Oroville and encouraged by some for the clarity it offers, the majority seem to resist and resent it, evidenced by the fact that new policies and processes are constantly being internally challenged and revised. During the time I was carrying out fieldwork alone, this was the case for a number of significant policies, such as the Code of Conduct for Orville's economic units, the new entry policy for the admission and termination of community membership, and the entire selection process for Orville's working groups. This dynamic is congruent with something the mother had insisted on, that there should be nothing fixed, no rules in Orville, in order to leave space for constant evolution. In Chapter 7 on Orville's economic governance, we will look at how this is enacted in what I theorize as a subjectively objective approach to administration. A government-enabled anarchy? It is the community's internal political practices, processes, and forms of organization or governance that are the subject of the entire ethnographic section of this thesis, with this first empirical chapter providing a general introduction and examination of Oroville as a polity. I say internal because there has always been a point of authority outside of the community exercising a degree of control over it. As was highlighted in the previous section, in the early years of the community, the mother de facto exercised a charismatic form of leadership. Today, Orville is registered as a foundation under the Human Resources Department of the Central Government, a structure that includes Indian government-appointed boards with advisory power over Oroville. An analysis of Orville's anarchic nature cannot exclude a consideration of this relationship with the Indian government. Its current and historical legal status within India will thus first be examined here. The Orville Foundation In 1968, the mother established Orville, registered under the Sri Aurobindo Society, 
a not-for-profit organization and research institute that she had founded in 1960. Following her death in 1973, the Sri Aurobindo Society sought to inherit the authority she had exercised over the community and illegally withheld funds donated to Orville as part of a bid for power in overseeing its management and development. This led to a court case resulting in a first instance in the passing of the Orville Emergency Provisions Act of 1980 by the Government of India. As per the Act, the management of all Orville assets were temporarily vested in the central government, stripping the Sri Aurobindo Society from any power over the community. In 1988, Orville's status was finalized with the passing of the Orville Foundation Act, which established Orville as a foundation, a statutory body under the auspices of the Human Resources Development Ministry, formerly the Ministry of Education, of India's central government. What authority over the community does the Act afford the Indian government? The Orville Foundation has three authorities the International Advisory Council, Governing Board, and Residence Assembly, together responsible for the, quote, management and further development of Oroville in accordance with its original charter. The Residence Assembly, RA, is composed of all adult members of the community and is responsible for all day-to-day -day management, administration, and decision-making. To carry out these responsibilities, it forms and selects a number of working groups to take up various aspects of community life. The parliamentary debates that led to the passing of the Orville Foundation Bill of 1988 evoke the importance of these, quote, autonomous arrangements for the development of Oroville. The governing board is composed of Indian citizens appointed by the central government, usually connected to the government and familiar with Sri Aurobindo's philosophy, and is vested with the, quote, general superintendence of the Orville Foundation. The governing board meets in Orville twice a year and is briefed on pertinent issues by its secretary, stationed in Orville, and by the Working Committee, a body constituted by the Act, consisting of Orvillians selected by the Orville Residence Assembly to liaise with the other official bodies of the Orville Foundation on behalf of the community. The Working Committee is also mandated to represent the interests of the community and its members in matters dependent on government involvement, for example visa issues or the planning of a highway through the Oroville area. While the Governing Board occasionally makes demands of certain Oroville working groups or institutions to take up new initiatives or lines of management, my brief and limited insight into these matters is that such pressurizing is largely unsuccessful. Key reasons for this being lack of familiarity with the complexity of the Orville context and with entrenched issues of power within the community and a lack of resources, most importantly, human resources. The governing board in turn is advised by the International Advisory Council, a body composed of eminent international figures also appointed by the central government. The incorporation of an international advisory council is in keeping with the mother's conception of Oroville as an international township. Such indications were intentionally heeded in the design of the act, as reported in the parliamentary debates pertaining to its passing. Quote, it is Sri Aurobindo and the mother who provide the vision for Oroville and the proposed foundation is intended to provide the infrastructure." Close quote. The central government appoints a secretary of the Oral Foundation to conduct the legal and financial administration of the latter under the authority of the governing board. While the Oral Foundation Secretariat at first undertook the management of Orville's funds and assets in addition to their legal financial administration, the former is now undertaken by an Orvillian working group the Funds and Assets Management Committee, or FAMC, formed in 2007 on the request of the Governing Board. While the Secretary of the Orville Foundation and its financial officer 
are officially members of the FAMC group. They did not attend its meetings, request its notes, or otherwise involve themselves in its decision-making processes during the period in which I was attending these as part of my field research. They do, however, retain overseeing power and may make requests of the FAMC to take up an issue that has come to their attention or counter decisions the group has taken. Significantly, there is no Indian police force or other form of Indian law enforcement service within Oroville. The community has been free to develop its own safety and security service and conflict resolution devices. The Orville Safety and Security Service does, however, interact with the local police to address offences perpetrated by non orvillians within the Orville area. Divine Intervention The Passing of the Orville Foundation Act The chief architect of the Act, Dr. Kirit Joshi, was a devotee of the mother and Sri Aurobindo a civil servant who had joined the Sri Aurobindo Ashram in 1956 and later been requested by the mother to rejoin the Indian government, thereafter acting as her instrument. His position enabled him to secure the first recurring source of funding from the HRD Ministry for Orville via the establishment of an educational research institution in the community, the Sri Aurobindo International Institute of Educational Research, or SAIER, and later to propose the structure of the Orville Foundation. Having been close to the mother, Dr. Joshi had an in-depth understanding of her vision for Orville and a commitment to serve its manifestation. Having been a civil servant, he was also well aware of the challenges and opportunities inherent in its incorporation into the Indian government. He was the perfect person to design a legal entity that would best safeguard and facilitate the development of Orville while fitting into the framework of the Indian government. That said, Dr. Joshi did not try to fit Orville into existing molds, but designed something unique and out of the box, especially in that it incorporated an international overseeing body, the International Advisory Council and gave Orville jurisdiction and decision-making powers over its internal affairs by establishing the Residence Assembly. The fact that such a tailored to Orville Act was passed unanimously in both Houses of Parliament is seen by many contemporary Orvillians as having been facilitated by a higher spiritual power, including but not limited to that of the Mother herself. It strongly contributes to a discourse of the community being an exceptional and unique project that is spiritually chaperoned and protected. The legal endorsement of the Indian government of the project of an experimental international township predicated on a spiritual utopianism also aligns with a larger discourse that celebrates India as a uniquely spiritually inclined nation a notion upheld by Sri Aurobindo and other in Indian spiritual leaders who affirm that the role of the Indian nation in the global context is to transmit its spiritual knowledge to serve humanity as a whole. Quote, India is the guru of the nations, the physician of the human soul in its profounder maladies. She is destined once more to new mold the life of the world and restore the peace of the human spirit. Sri Aurobindo From the spiritual standpoint, India is the leading country in the world. Her mission is to give the example of spirituality. The Mother This is the ancient land where wisdom made its home before it went into any other country. This is the land from whence, like the tidal waves, Spirituality and philosophy have again and again rushed out and deluged the world. And this is the land from whence, once more, such tides must proceed in order to bring life and vigor into the decaying races of mankind. Swami Vivekananda India's Vedic and yogic spirituality 
was introduced to Western European and Northern American popular culture in the 1960s, notably by music bands such as the Beatles. And in the past few decades, India has arguably emerged as the major spiritual destination of the world. The current Hindutva, Hindu Nationalist Party, the BJP, in power since 2014, has actively marketed India as such, creating the International Yoga Day holiday and introducing a yoga visa for visitors to India. Narendra Modi, the current Prime Minister of India, is famous for his spiritual activities. Photos of him meditating in a secluded cave in the Himalayas to, spe- to seek spiritual communion at the eve of his re-election in May 2019 made headlines and Twitter feeds. It is important to note that while India has a majority of Hindus, whose religion is based on Vedic scripture, it has other long-standing indigenous spiritual and religious traditions, such as Buddhism, Sikhism, and Jainism, and that these are currently excluded from the national representation of Indian spirituality, as is the spirituality practiced by India's Adivasi tribal groups. National and Supranational Endorsement of Oroville How has the Oroville project been perceived and supported by the Indian government currently and historically? Several Indian political leaders have paid dignitary visits to the community, each making positive statements on Oroville. The first was Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in 1969, who was later instrumental in the passing of the Orville Emergency Provisions Act of 1980. Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi granted Orvillians an audience during the lead-up to the Orville Foundation Act of 1988, which he ensured would be favorable to Oroville. During my fieldwork in February 2018, the country's current Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited the community to mark its 50th anniversary. Following a meditation in the Matramandir, Oroville's spiritual center, he gave a speech exhorting the community's ideals and activities over the past five decades, linking these to India's Vedic spiritual tradition. Kiran Bedi, the Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry, the closest metropolitan center to Oroville, joined Modi for his Golden Jubilee visit and has paid several of her own to Oroville, notably to highlight and promote socially inclusive and ecological practices in the local region, such as wheelchair accessibility and cycling. Beyond the Indian context, Orville has also long been recognized and endorsed by UNESCO, featuring in five UNESCO resolutions to date, given the community's alignment with UNESCO's core values, notably of peace and harmony, cultural diversity, lifelong education and sustainability. This combination of both national and international recognition and an incorporated status under an Indian government ministry that grants Oroville legal status and protection is significant, especially in light of the history of intentional communities. Most of these communal experiments have dissolved in the face of pressure and prejudice from the surrounding dominant host society and its government institutions. Their disbandment was often precipitated by the fact that alternative practices did not fit into existing legal frameworks. Oroville Foundation Act, facilitating a government-enabled anarchy. It is thus pertinent to highlight that the Oroville Foundation Act provided a facilitative legal framework for the realization of some of Oroville's key ideals. As previously noted, the tripartite body of the Oroville Foundation allows for the development of an Orovillian society as decided upon and enacted by an entirely Orovillian body politic, the Residence Assembly. This allows for the freedom of experimentation, formulation and reformulation in accordance with the emerging needs and spiritual progress of current residents, as intended by the mother. 
The Indian government also grants Orvillians five-year entry visas, unique in India, which allow foreign members to reside and work within Orville and thus realize its aspiration of being an international township. Furthermore, the legal economic structure of the Orville Foundation is such that all of its funds and immovable assets are vested within it, effectively enabling the economic ideal of no private property and of non-ownership of the project as specified in the Orville Charter. This is significant to note because alternative economic practices based on non-individual and non-capitalist forms in intentional community contexts and beyond, are among the many that struggle to be legalized. The legal status of cooperatives is a rare example of success in this regard. In addition to legal restrictions, financial pressure has also historically compromised the viability of other intentional community projects, leading Oneida, for example, to restructure as a joint stock company. Thus, it is important to highlight that the Indian government makes a yearly grant to Orville for its research and infrastructure. One of the grant's beneficiaries is the Sri Aurobindo International Institute of Educational Research, SAIR, which funds much of Orville's experimental educational institutions and projects. This directly facilitates Orville realizing itself as a site of unending education one of the key points of its charter. L'Avenir d'Auroville, Orville's town planning body, is another beneficiary, receiving annual funding for roads and infrastructure. Some of Orville's working groups, the Working Committee, Funds and Assets Management Committee, and L'Avenir d'Auroville, also receive funding for member stipends and basic expenditures, such as office expenses and member training. In addition to these recurring grants, community members have been successful in obtaining government funding for specific projects. All allocations of Government of India grants are approved by the governing board, however. A recent example is the residential project Humanscapes, allocated to Orville youth, the majority of whom do not have the financial resources to secure their own housing. The fact that Orville receives significant funding from the Government of India is celebrated by some community members and associates and is a cause for concern to others. The fact that this funding comes with its own restrictions elements the development of certain sectors or aspects of Orvillian society that may not be congruent with the community's own development priorities, a key example being the funding of buildings that exceed the needs of the current population which is then compelled to bear the cost of their ongoing maintenance. That said, building projects are proposed by community members, not the Indian government. In recent decades, the community has not undergone a collective process to determine what its funding priorities would be. Budget requests for Government of India grants or to other international funding bodies, their own specifications aside, thus do not base themselves on a community mandate of development. Typically, they are initially approved in a process internal to Oroville at the discretion of selection teams of Orovillians. These teams are normally appointed and overseen by Oroville's Working Committee and the Funds and Assets Management Committee, or the executives of government-funded institutions within Oroville, such as the Sri Aurobindo International Institute of Educational Research. Sayer, and Bard Nivas, Orville's Pavilion of India. Alter Development and the State Orville's unique status within the legal framework of the Indian government allows it to retain autonomy over its internal affairs, enabling it to be self-managing and to experiment with alternative practices while benefiting from government endorsement and funding this is especially significant when considering that legal and financial pressure has compromised the viability of other intentional community projects. However, scholars of the community have expressed concerns around the co-optation of the project due to its relational enmeshment with the Indian government, 
as well as its embeddedness in a capitalist context. Is Orville a government-enabled anarchy? At the very least, its example compels us to consider the role of the state in facilitating alter development. The two have predominantly been pitted against one another, all the recent research points to an alternative assessment. The economist Mariana Mazzucato highlights the little-known role that governments already play in enabling innovative development as the critical funders of early-stage research into alternative practices that can eventually reshape entire industries towards the public good. This stands in contrast to the narrative that the private sector fuels innovation. Furthermore, such investment is predicated on financial return rather than social and environmental benefit, which is the primary objective of governments and NGO grants to Oroville. Government grants to Orville are thus, importantly, free of co-optation by the logic of the market and help to buffer the community from its pressures. While a primary source of external funding to Orville, currently and historically, comes from the Government of India and charitable foundations, not corporations, it is relevant to note that recently, both national and international corporations have financed projects in Orville as part of their corporate social responsibility schemes. The prefigurative scholar Lara Monticelli questions the assumption that the types of alliances Orville has with government and industry necessarily imply co-optation, and asks instead whether these might be an indicator of the success of a prefigurative project. Quote, Isn't it exactly when a municipality, a state, a supranational institution, or even a multinational corporation starts to recognize a best practice and to encourage its growth through funds and favorable policies, that prefigurative movements can consider themselves as having succeeded in their goal? Or is this co-optation nullifying their efforts? Close quote. Thomas More's literary utopia and many others are conceived as islands, disconnected from the real world, and criticized for their irrelevance as a result, as were utopian community projects that tried to isolate themselves from the contexts in which they were nonetheless necessarily embedded. It seems disingenuous today to require prefiguratively utopian projects to be of the world, but not to engage with it. There is no utopian formula that can ensure the degree of boundedness required for experimenting with alternatives and of the enmeshment that seems critical to the sustainability and success of such projects. But a dynamic, reflexive balance, and perhaps even a degree of compromise, between seclusion and engagement seems to be essential for utopian practice as we theorize it today. Orville's self-governance. Now that the relationship between Orville and the government of India has been elucidated, we turn to the second focus of this chapter, which is Orville's self-governance and political practice. In this section, I start my examination of Orville as a polity, beginning by tracing the development and structure of Orville's administrative apparatus analyzing the political participation of Orvillians and assessing the political practice of direct democracy that Orville currently employs. A direct democracy is a practice of self-governance in which all members of a collective have equal access to participate in decision-making processes, which are typically based on some form of consensus and not on voting and representation as is the case in a representative democracy. Often employed in organizing social movements exercising direct action, such as Occupy Wall Street and the Global Justice Movement, the term is used interchangeably with anarchy or democracy without the government. The ethos of equality and fraternity that underscores this horizontal, collective and consensus-based practice resonates with many contemporary intentional communities, which also practice it in some form. Orville, being the largest and most complex of these communal experiments, 
and being of a perennial nature, unlike most social movements, offers a unique case study of this exercise of governance. Residence Assembly and Working Groups We begin by tracing the development of Orville's administrative apparatus of self-governance by what is referred to in the Orville Foundation Act as the Residence Assembly, all community members over 18. In its early years, when the community was made up of only a few hundred people, decision-making was undertaken collectively at weekly community meetings, today referred to as general meetings, in which any Orvillian could bring a topic and express their resonance or concern with the issues raised to arrive at a consensus. As the community grew and became more complex, groups were formed to take responsibility for specific aspects, a common scaling mechanism in direct democratic forms, by bottom-up processes initiated by community members and agreed upon collectively in general meetings. When Orville was constituted as a foundation, this existing anarchic structure of self-governance was formalized to a certain extent. As highlighted previously, the Orville Foundation Act of 1988 defined and mandated a residence assembly, the totality of Orville residents over 18 years of age, with the authority to manage the community's internal affairs. It also decreed the constitution of a working committee to assist it, including representing it when liaising with the government. It is important to note that a precursor to the working committee already existed named the Co-op, which was responsible for representing Orville and its interactions with official bodies. As per the Act, the working committee would be chosen by the Residence Assembly in a selection process of their design. Orville's administrative groups thus vary in their level of officialdom according to whether they are formally mandated by the Orville Foundation and therefore officially accountable to its governing board, or whether they exist purely within the civil society space of Orville, which means they answer only to the Residence Assembly and can be dissolved or changed at any time. The working groups that are directly accountable to the Orville Foundation are, at present, the Working Committee, the Funds and Assets Management Committee, and Orville's Town Development Council. The structure, membership, selection and functioning of even these working groups is designed and can be amended by the Residence Assembly. In 2014, a new participatory working group model was ratified by the community to be adopted by Orville's major working groups with an accompanying selection process, examined in Chapter 6. Two of these working groups recently underwent a restructure the Funds and Assets Management Committee in 2016 and the Town Development Council in 2017. All of Orville's working groups are composed of community members either selected by the community at large in a selection process or of representatives of various sectors of the Orville community such as commerce or forestry. In the latter case, what I refer to in this thesis as sector groups grassroots collectives made up of anyone active within them. For example, all farmers are de facto members of the farm group, which take responsibility for the administration of their respective sectors, select their own representatives to working groups. It is important to note that members of working groups are not elected representatives to whom Orvillians transfer their political power. Any major decisions they wish to take on behalf of the community must be ratified in community-wide general meetings, the ultimate decision-making forum of the community. Thus, authority lies not with working groups, but with the community at large. Working groups must also regularly publish reports of their meetings and process any feedback received on their decisions from other community members. Importantly, Working groups do not have the exclusive right to make a proposal to the community for ratification at a general meeting. The Residence Assembly Service, the organization and communication platform at the service of the Residence Assembly, calls these meetings on the request of either working groups or other residents. 
Often, it is proposals made by informal groups of concerned Orvillians, which I will refer to as concerned groups, that drive change in the community, rather than the working groups officially in charge. In community presentations, the latter repeatedly report being bogged down in the firefighting of addressing pressing, everyday issues in the area of community life they are responsible for, such as funds and assets management. This is a significant phenomenon to note, as it affirms the political potential and responsabilization of citizens who are empowered to shape their polities. Historically, civilian protest and social movements have driven change in many democratic societies, consider the women's liberation and civil rights movements. However, the demands these made nonetheless had to be accepted by politicians who had the exclusive right to write policy. In Oroville, anyone can design and propose a policy or the amendment to a policy and bring it to the community at large for ratification without having to petition a working group to adopt it first. A recent example is the entry policy, which was amended in 2017 through such a process. As we will see in Chapter 8, community members have also instigated the provision of cooperative public services, thus performing an act of citizenship. Working group members' terms vary in length from one to five years, and many pursue other roles in the community meanwhile. My mother, for example, has been the executive of the Orville Visitor Center for almost 20 years, and has also served on various working groups throughout this period. Only few Orvillians are the equivalent to career public servants, remaining exclusively engaged as working group members, a role that is not necessarily remunerated, shifting from one working group to another once their terms come to an end. The turnover in working group membership, along with the magnitude of working groups in Oroville, has entailed that a significant number of Orvillians have served in at least one of these at some point during their community membership. As a result, they have insight into the pertinent and often perennial issues of the community and have undergone the exercise of engaging with these. This empowers them to continue to do so beyond their term as working group members by forming part of what I referred to earlier in this section as concerned groups, associations of activist or civilians spearheading change in the community. Not infrequently, these politically active individuals are concurrently part of a working group. General Meetings Despite this rich grassroots political participation in Oroville, the number of people who attend general meetings or vote, a controversial practice that was adopted relatively recently and will be addressed further in this section, is relatively small. In the largest general meetings I attended during my fieldwork, there were approximately 200 people. Incidentally, this is the same number currently required for a community vote to be considered valid, and works out to approximately 10% of the adult Oroville population. Many Orvillians and scholars of the community use these figures as defining measures of low political participation of Orvillians. However, Many community members who do not participate in general meetings or vote on community-wide matters are engaged in forums at other scales, more directly related to their areas of interest and activity, and thus cannot be considered politically inactive. For instance, the monthly meetings of the forest group, which I sat in on during my fieldwork, were the best attended of any sector group I know. But I only ever saw very few forest group members in general meetings. In my observations and experience, virtually all aspects of community life and development in Orville are constantly being deliberated and redefined at various scales and in various, and sometimes overlapping, collective processes. These are notoriously time-consuming and wearisome. Even the staunchest proponents of such direct democratic practice concede that the engagement it requires is trying. The sheer magnitude of such processes occurring in Oroville at any given time is overwhelming. Even dedicating myself full-time to doctoral field research was impossible to follow each, 
let alone be an active participant in them. When we consider this degree of routine political engagement that is embedded in everyday life in Orville, and that this is at least part of the reason why people do not additionally participate in many community-wide processes, the attendance rates of the latter can no longer be considered as an accurate indicator of the political activity of Orvillians. That said, it is important not to ignore dissatisfaction with general meetings and other collective, community-wide decision-making processes, much of which is common to direct and participatory democratic models and experiences worldwide, as a significant deterrent to participation. Specific points of dissatisfaction include the high investment in time, lack of confidence in an actionable outcome, unpleasant interpersonal dynamics, and the challenge of public speaking. The latter is compounded in Orville's multinational context, given that meetings are held in English, which makes them not only difficult to contribute to, but even to comprehend for the community's many non-native English speakers. Furthermore, the sense of entitlement to speak is influenced by race and nationality, gender and age, class and caste, which inextricably and invisibly shapes even horizontally designed assemblies. Other consensus decision-making forums, notably the Global Justice Movement and Occupy Wall Street, have tried to address some of these challenges with specific facilitation measures and practices to prefigure inclusive, equitable and efficient political forums with varying levels of success. While adopting some of these in Orville's collective decision-making processes could be beneficial, a key concern is that the latter do not reflect the spiritualization we aspire for, and even the best participatory facilitation measures may not succeed in remedying this. Attempts to do so will be examined in the following chapter on the selection process of Orville's working groups. In the next section, we turn to the practice of voting in Orville which is also a factor in the dissatisfaction with general meetings, as these, as these have felt like increasingly disempowered forms since its adoption. Voting in Oroville Today, community at large ratification requires that a proposal be presented at a general meeting in which it is either exceptionally accepted as is or feedback given is to be incorporated as amendments the proposal is then presented once again for ratification, usually by an online voting process coordinated by the Residence Assembly Service. For a yes vote to be considered valid, typically a quorum of 200 people have to have voted, and at least 80% have to have voted yes. Because decisions are no longer finalized at the meetings themselves, but instead communicated to the community at large to vote on, the consensus outcome of general meetings effectively have no teeth, as someone recently put it in, in a collective discussion on decision-making in Oroville. While voting is a practice that is skewed by groups practicing consensus decision-making because it neither allows for dialogue nor ensures outcomes that the vast majority of participants will be satisfied with, a high majority vote is a common tool. Even this high majority voting practice is controversial in Oroville. Some people find it to be an obvious, simple way to ensure participation of a wider group of community members than those who are able or inclined to attend a general meeting. Indeed, participation in such anarchist assemblies is restricted to those who can commit the time required to do so. Other Orvillians, however, consider voting to be poor communal decision-making practice because people who have not been part of a collective process on a particular issue can still vote on it. Furthermore, voting is a fundamentally individual practice, while Orville is an experiment in collectivity. They maintain that a collective will is not the same as the sum of individual wills, which is what voting is. It matures out of a shared experience. There is an even deeper dimension of this reticence to the summing up of individual wills that underscores both representative and direct democracies, and it is related to the ideal of Orville as a polity 
dedicated to the Divine's will. Quote, At one time it was said that the Residence Assembly's fundamental function is to arrive at an agreement. This statement is good, but not sufficient. It is not an instrument of agreement and disagreement. The starting point is wrong. It is to mature, constantly, the sense of all of us as a collectivity devoted to the Divine's will. David C. In this context, what is of paramount importance is not achieving agreements between personal opinions, views and desires, which Orwellians see as belonging to the realm of the individual ego. One marking statement I heard an Orwellian make in a selection process for working group members was that they should be, quote, at the service of Orville and not of Orwellians, close quote. Our extensive use of democratic processes overall is thus felt by many to be a poor exercise in prefiguring the spiritualized society we aspire for. Orville's working groups, from a direct to a representative democracy. In recent years, there has been a marked shift away from a direct democratic spokes council model of organization in which many working groups were composed of members of various sector groups of Oroville as representatives appointed by the latter towards more of a representative democratic model in which working group members are selected from and by the community at large in a process that Chapter 6 explores. This section will examine the case of an Orville working group that recently underwent such a community-mandated restructure to understand the reasons for this and its repercussions. From a representative to a participatory group, the case of the FAMC. In 2016, the Residence Assembly voted for the Funds and Assets Management Committee, FAMC, Orville's overarching economic administration group to become a participatory working group. The FAMC had heretofore been a representative group comprised of members of various sector groups of Oroville, such as agriculture, education, commerce, public services, appointed by and accountable to the latter. Now, as a participatory working group, its members were to be selected by and from the community at large. Any Orvillian adult could be selected, regardless of their degree or area of involvement in the community. In fact, there are no criteria of eligibility whatsoever in the selection process for participatory working groups. By contrast, the representative working group model had ensured that those participating in decision-making were active in what had been identified as a stakeholding field. They were also directly answerable to their sector and could be recalled and replaced by their sector group at any time, so that decision-making power was held in a collective and not an individual locus. In a participatory working group, members are selected by the community at large for a term and have no clearly defined and practicable individualized answerability to a sector group or to the community at large. Transitioning to participatory working groups was, interestingly, effectuated to further democratize and collectivize governance in Oroville by making it possible for any community member to occupy roles previously reserved for active stakeholders. The use of the term participatory reflects this broader inclusivity. However, with selected members not necessarily being familiar with the ground realities of the sectors they administer, working groups risk becoming an alienated apparatus of governance, even if their selection process is more communal. The representative FAMC group that was in place when the process of its reconfiguration was underway had anticipated this shortcoming. When consulted about the shift to participatory working group, they recommended that there be at least a 50-50 split between representative members appointed by sector groups and members chosen from and by the community at large in the participatory working group selection process because they found that it was key to have representatives of specific sectors present during the decision-making process. 
the outcome of the process was nonetheless to adopt the participatory working group policy of selecting all members to and from the community at large. Interestingly, some of the members who formed the last representative FAMC were selected for the first participatory FAMC and were able to compare their experiences of both. They remarked that, with the direct representation of key sectors unassured, the effectiveness of the team was riddled by gaps of knowledge, information and perspective. It was now more laborious and time-consuming to arrive at a decision because of missing information pertaining to a specific sector in discussion. And in such situations, further deliberation and ensuing decision-making had to be postponed for the required information to be obtained meanwhile. In the following sections, other issues with both the participatory and representative working group model will be addressed. Issues related to membership in participatory and representative groups. Another weakness of the participatory working group model related to membership, which the first participatory FAMC faced under its new configuration, is, ironically, human resources. Because all members at the table were selected by the community at large in a community ratified process that occurred only once a year, if selected members decided to resign or travel for an extensive period, or were otherwise incapacitated during their term, they could not be substituted by another subgroup member, as would have been the case in the previous representative working group model. I attended the meetings of both a representative and a participatory working group as part of my field research. In the representative group, a member absent for three meetings was replaced by another from his sector group. In the participatory group, there was a period of two weeks in which, due to a combination of resigned and temporarily absent members, the group did not constitute the quorum required for decisions to be taken. Addressing this very issue, the report of the Land Board Selection Process includes a recommendation that its mandate be amended to include a provision stating that a minimum of two standby nominees be chosen to replace any community-selected members who resign mid-term. While this could effectively resolve the issue of resignation of community-selected members, assuming the standby nominees may still be available for the role, it does not address the issue of temporary leaves of absence, which can also cripple the effective functioning of a team. A criticism of membership in the representative working group model, however, is that sometimes sector group members take up or retain a working group post because none of their colleagues is willing to. On one representative working group, whose meetings I attended during fieldwork, a member wanted to step down for a year, but no one from his sector subgroup was willing to replace him. So he carried on, but was largely disengaged. For another, a sector subgroup sent a representative who was by all accounts, both of the sector group in question and of the working group, unsuitable for the task, as a critique of the very existence of an overseeing group. This considerably negatively impacted the team dynamics and functioning of the working group, and there seems to have been no effective mechanism by which a representative group could request a problematic member to be replaced if the sector subgroup refused to comply. Indeed, a criticism of membership in representative groups is that, while sector representatives may be competent in their fields of work in the community, they may not be in community administration. However, the current process for selecting members from the community at large does not address this issue because there are no qualifying criteria for nominees. It thus provides no safeguard against the scenario in which people who have neither the skills required for such administrative posts, nor a direct connection with ground realities in one or more sectors, are selected. While a sector subgroup is likely to know the people who they are selecting or endorsing as a representative, their skill set and ability to work in a team, a selection committee of community members is often faced with selecting people whom they may or may not know personally and do not necessarily have any experience of working with. Alternatives to consider In the interest of producing scholarship that responds to practice and not only to academic discourse, 
I include here a few alternatives to consider for the exercise of reconfiguring Orville's working groups that respond to the concerns that brought the participatory working group model about. Given that the creation of representative groups is a common phenomenon in direct democratic forms of political organization, these are likely to be translatable into other such contexts. To address the issue of a recurring cohort of people being posted to representative working groups, the effort to incorporate new members in governance would perhaps best be undertaken at the sector group level. Few of these have any new active members. This would retain the direct democratic nature of representative working groups, which by design is more likely to ensure connection with ground realities and accountable channels of communication both of which are key concerns for the functioning of working groups and are not responded to in the participatory working group model. Another option is to improve on and multiply a practice already exercised in some of Orville's representative working groups, members who represent the community at large. Currently, there are no instructions for how such members represent or are accountable to the community. Developing guidelines to yield effective processes for the latter would be worth undertaking. Such defined community-at-large roles would also be useful in the context of participatory working groups. While being directly accountable and in communication with sector group members is a built-in feature of the representative group model, avenues and forums for meaningful, consistent and responsive deliberation between the community and members of selected working group teams are lacking. While the original participatory working group policy mandated that participatory working groups meet the residents' assembly quarterly in an open community meeting, this has not occurred in practice. In the recently revised document, these mandated meetings have dropped from quarterly to twice a year betraying the weakness of its design for ensuring improved communication with and accountability to the broader community. Many more measures could be envisaged and experimented with for bettering Orville's participatory democratic practice. These could significantly improve residents' experiences of and participation in community-level decision-making and administration. Such amelioration may be sufficient to address current dissatisfaction with and disengagement from Orville's internal governance and prefigure a satisfactory model of anarchist organizing that could be adopted in other contexts. However, the fact that Orville is already a formidable and long-standing enactment of such a direct and participatory mode of collective organizing may also compel us, within and beyond Orville, to question and imagine beyond, towards something both equitable and efficient, able to avoid burnout and to ensure inspired, sustained participation. For Orvillians, this is strongly tied to such processes aspiring towards in concretizing harmonious and spiritually evolved individual and collective states, explored in the following chapter. Conclusion is an anarchist polity a utopia? Orville's anarchic political mode is key to its prefiguratively utopian nature, contrasting it from historical utopian communities that were predicated on blueprints. One of the open questions in intentional community research is how contemporary anarchist communities are able to sustain themselves over time. Orville's legal and economic relationship with the Indian government has significantly contributed to its growth and survival, while enshrining the self-governance of the community. In Chapter 7, however, we will also explore how this relationship interfered with Orville's communal economic organization. Its founding political ideal, which contributes to defining its practice of prefiguring a spiritualized society, is that of a divine anarchy, one in which the exercise of governance would be flexible and responsive to a spiritual evolution of consciousness, a divine consciousness. Since its early years, the Orville community has espoused direct democratic forms of governance, 
developing forms and processes of political administration that empower participation, consensus decision-making, and reformulation. Similar models of anarchist decision-making have been used to organize thousands of participants in direct action social movements, such as Occupy Wall Street and the Global Justice Movement. While the Orville community is not larger in terms of participants, it is far more all-encompassing than such direct actions. As the largest intentional community in the world, it provides a unique case study in which to assess the viability and absorb the trajectory of such forms of organizing, whose limitations in terms of scale, efficiency, equitability and sustainability have already been raised. While the township's political administration developed through the classic scaling mechanisms of anarchist models, with the multiplication of representative groups, this horizontal mode has nonetheless resulted in a sense of alienation between working groups and the community at large, and a perceived concentration of power among recurring working group members. Ironically, in recent years, attempts to broaden community at large participation in governance through the participatory working group model are instigating a transition from a direct to a representative democratic mode of political organization. A central concern remains how political practice in Orville is spiritually prefigurative, engaging of the community's spiritual ideals, both within working groups and in community-wide processes. The following chapter will explore the selection process for Orville's working groups, highlighting spiritually prefigurative practices used within it. The upcoming Chapter 7 on Orville's Communal Economy will examine how an Orville working group articulated the community's ideals in its administrative practice. <laughs>